Good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here on a beautiful, foggy Bodega Bay morning for our first ever Sea Otter Reintroduction Summit. You know, I am actually um, sort of a scientist by academic training who currently is a full-time elected official, which really makes me an anomaly. Um, and, you know, too often, scientists don't talk to politicians who often don't recognize the traditional indigenous wisdom held by the tribes who have stewarded this land for tens of thousands of years. And oftentimes also, politicians and government systems don't engage community-based organizations and key stakeholders at the inception of a process. Too often, people kind of come together at the 11th hour when things are already done and you're seeking last minute endorsements instead of actually having a collaborative, formative process. We are here today to shatter that paradigm. We are here to forge an alliance of tribal, local, state, federal, academic, and community-based partners. But before we begin and before we launch this summit, I want to take one moment just to ground us in place. We are here at the edge of Bodega Bay. Behind me, not all that long ago in the grand scheme of things, thousands of sea otters used to float in rafts. And importantly, we are on the Sonoma Coast, which was stewarded for tens of thousands of years by the Coast Miwok and Pomo people. And when you sort of stand here on this space, it's also a space that is actually has very important historic significance to the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria. And the road itself, actually, that you all drove in on does as well. And so I'm extraordinarily honored to be joined today by tribal chairman of the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria, Dr. Greg Saris, who will be presenting and providing an introductory welcome. Um, and I just want to acknowledge the tremendous um, sort of advocate and force of nature that he has been for good in Sonoma County, and not only at the local level, but also at the state and federal level. And as a reminder, um, this is something that I often say to community members who don't understand why tribes have such influence over certain processes. Um, when we are addressed by a tribal chairman, we are really being addressed by a head of state. And so I am so grateful that you are taking the time um, out of your day to come and be with us today, and also for your tribe's willingness in general to participate in our local processes and to be a true partner. You have worked alongside many of the folks in this room um, with regional parks and through joint management agreements and others. So thank you so much, and please join me in a warm welcome for Chairman Saris. Thank you so much, Supervisor Hopkins. I've uh, got allergies a little bit, so my voice is scratchy. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming. And again, as you said, um, it's so important that we work together, especially on anything in, with restoration or environmental issues here. Um, so often, again, we are consulted after decisions have been made. Um, and again, that's a following a long paradigm. Uh, you mentioned the road here, it's Smith Brothers. Um, my great, great, great grandmother was Supu. She was born in Petaluma and escaped the Mexicans there, escaped Vallejo, walked 50 miles barefoot up the coast to Matini, the village at Fort Ross. Um, and there she uh, had three children by a, what the way they used to call a Creole, a guy that was Aleut, um, a Russian, and Kashaya Pomo. The, the, it was very interesting because the Russians, as you know, brought the Aleuts here to help them hunt the sea otters. Um, but anyway, uh, when the Russians abandoned the fort in 1842, um, she uh, took her three children and came down to Bodega Bay and became the maid slash mistress of Captain Stephen Smith. She named her first three children Smith to protect them from slavery, from marauders. Um, and so we're all Smiths, it's just, and it's biblical, it's just which, do we come from Komshatal or Smith? The Smith brothers here are the, are the descendants of Stephen Smith. Um, all right, um, a little bit about who we were. Obviously, as has been mentioned, you're on Coast Miwok territory here. Um, at, at the time of contact, there were about 20,000 people who were classified as Coast Miwok or Southern Pomo. Southern Pomo being 
um, Southern Sonoma County and Coast Miwok, all of Marin County. There was never anything, no tribe called Coast Miwok or Pomo. Those are ethnographers' names. They classified us by language families. Coast Miwok is a Penutian language, uh, and Pomo is a Hokan language. Pomo, for instance, the language family goes into Oaxaca, Mexico. The Penutian language family goes up into uh, Alaska and Canada. Um, we lived in small nations, a thousand to 2,000 people in a nation, very small nations. Um, there were more people in this area and generally in Central California than there was anywhere else in the entire New World except for the present site of Mexico City, which was the Aztec capital. People say, how did so many people live together for th so long with virtually no physical warfare? Well, of course, the missionaries and others thought we were stupid. And of course, the Europeans thought we were the stupidest of the Indians because as with most of us, we see through things, other cultures, other people through our own lens. And what did the Europeans value? The Europeans valued organized warfare. And the Plains Indians had organized warfare. Of course, never, never want to stop and think about how many people could live together so closely. Simply put, we were con societies constructed of uh, small secret societies where we believed every, you had special spirits and you were um, brought in as a, usually when you were young, 13 or 14, and inducted into these secret societies. We believed that everything on earth was sacred. A rock, a piece, anything was sacred. And if you violated it, it would come back. So each person also had songs and was considered sacred. I have songs and things that would protect me, but if you stole something from me or hurt me or did something like that, um, the next day, your mother or somebody would drop dead. We poisoned you. So the early ethnographers classified our cultures as cultures predicated on fear and black magic, when in fact they were predicated on profound respect. If I had to go and hit Supervisor Hopkins, you would see that I had no spiritual power. Physical warfare was considered the lowest form of warfare. So, and again, it worked. The societies were structured with nature in a sustainable way. To be members of these secret societies, you first in your, when you were training, you had to abstain from meat and sex for seven years. So again, we kept the populations down uh, considerably. Um, the missions came 1776, San Rafael 1812, Mission Solano, the last mission in the chain, 1823. Then the Mexican period came, and the Mexicans used exactly what the Spanish and Portuguese used to colonize the New World. They were Catholic, they were against slavery, but they got around it. Indentured servitude, vagrancy laws, and convict leasing. That's essentially how they justified enslaving the entire New World. The first uh, piece of legislation that was enacted in the state of California in 1850 was the Act for the Government and Protection of Indians, which legalized Indian slavery. Indians became the rightful property of whosoever land they were on, and they had the right to sell them or use them or do whatever. That was not repealed until 1868, after the three years after the end of the Civil War. Ironically, General Vallejo, who was defeated by the first governor of this state, was the one who told the governor how to handle the Indian situation. So he gave him the blueprint for our continued enslavement. We then, after 1868 here, became indentured servants of whosoever land we were on. Uh, in my case, it was because of Supu and others um, who were able to be mistresses to the early Americans that we were here. Today, there are 1,500 enrolled members of the Federated Indians of Great, Great Rancheria who are descendants of Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo. All of us trace our ancestry back to one of 14 survivors, all of whom were women, all of whom were concubines of early Americans or the Mexicans. So went the Indians, the natives, the indigenous people. So went the otters. So went the trees, everything else. The first historical record that we know of, of the sea otter hunting from Americans was about 1806. And then, of course, the Russians came and were right around in this bay where there were so many otters. Um, and eventually, in 1812, they established, as I alluded to earlier, they established a uh, colony up at Fort Ross. 
They left, they abandoned the fort in 1842 because they had killed all the otters from Monterey all the way past Point Arena and Eureka. It, they were in a tra uh, was trading the pelts with the Chinese. They came down here specifically to hunt the pelts. That's why uh, uh, they, they came. Um, and so when we think today about what we're going to do and how we're going to work together, I want you to imagine what it was like for indigenous people who believed everything was sacred and everything was interconnected and anything you did to anything would have consequences to a people who came and were chopping down the trees, killing the animals and doing all of the kinds of things that were so antithetical to the way we thought. And, um, you know, um, you know, the Kashaya Pomo people call, um, up north, call the Europeans or white people palachai, and that, they call, that translates to miracles. And I used to ask the old people why they called white people miracles. And they said, because when they were coming and killing everything, cutting down trees, damming up the water, instead of getting punished, more of them kept coming. We thought they were miraculous. Well, again, as we sit here today, and think about the otters and what we're going to do. We have to think, again, out of that European system. The Europeans believed in that great chain of being, God on top, man, of course, woman below man, all the way down. And they had the right to do anything. And only God up above, who doesn't live somewhere up there, is sacred. Your home isn't here, it's up there. So how do we shift a mindset? How do we think about reintroducing the otters? We can't think about a keystone species without thinking about the entire ecosystems and ourselves in it. That's the holistic indigenous way of thinking. And you know, so often people want to introduce or protect a keytone, keystone uh, species, but they forget the modern world in which we're in and all of the things we have to negotiate as we do this. So, can we consider the urchins, the abalone, the kelp, all the things that the sea otters need to survive? How are we gonna take care of that as we're sitting here today thinking we want to take care of the otters? We have to think holistically. We have to work together. We have to forfeit that mindset of single purpose to whole purpose. And I hope that that's exactly what we'll be doing today. So thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Thank you so much, um, Chairman Saris. That was a really wonderful note to begin on. Um, and I am actually going to be introducing um, Tracy Lyons, who will be sort of facilitating everything. And I'm guessing that every single person in this room heard from Tracy. She has been the magic behind um, the creation and the bringing together of this summit. And I also wanted um, to take a moment and ask any other tribal representatives um, who are present to stand, because there is actually a wonderful um, network of tribes coming together um, to really kind of advance this cause. I know this is a, a sort of top priority. So I would like to sort of stand and acknowledge your participation, if you would. So. Thank you so much. So, thank, you. thank you. And I unfortunately received word that Chairman Franklin was unable to join us. Um, and Nina Hapner, who I believe is also um, part of the Marine Tribal Network, was unable to attend as well. But the good news is we have a very packed agenda. And so this will actually give us a little bit of leeway. And I do want to mention, um, before we transition to our first panel, that we will have an opportunity um, during lunch to do a brief round of introductions. Because I'm guessing that there are a lot of folks who would like to know who the other folks are in the audience. And everyone who is here is here for a reason and has a role to play. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Tracy to introduce our next moderator. Good morning. It's so wonderful to see everyone in person. And today I have the honor of introducing Dr. Brent Hughes, Assistant Professor at Sonoma State University. 
Dr. Hughes is, uh, specializes in ecology and conservation of marine ecosystems. He is broadly interested in determining the processes that affect the stability of coastal ecosystems. His research centers around coastal habitats, seagrass, salt marsh, and kelp, which provide valuable ecosystem services, yet are threatened by human activity and increasing ecological crises. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Brent Hughes, moderator of our first panel, Sea Otter History and Status on the Northern Coast and Potential Reintroduction Options. And as Dr. Hughes makes his way to the stage, please note that underneath your table um, number, there is a, a stack of papers that you can record questions on for our panel moderators. And we'll have a Q&A session toward the end of our day together. Thanks, Thanks Tracy. <clears throat> so today, we're, we're going to have several panels kind of discussing what we know about sea otters and their role in marine ecosystems, especially here in Northern California. Um, the first panel that's going to come up is going to talk about the history of sea otters. And we're primarily going to focus on the history of sea otters here in Northern California. But I need to at least spend a little bit of time just kind of informing folks why are we here talking about one single animal. And as Chairman Saris mentioned, the sea otter has this 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 term that is associated with it called a keystone species. And what does that mean? Well, it means that they have this disproportionate effect on ecosystems. And because of it, they play this keystone role. They have this role in ecosystems primarily because they eat a lot. Um, compared to any other marine predator that we know of, the sea otter proportionally based on their diet and, and their weight, eat about a quarter of their biomass every single day to survive. And because of it, they have these huge effects on marine ecosystems. And because of that, there's also this conflict that occurs because they like to eat the same things we humans like to eat, such as abalone and urchins and crab. And so <clears throat> there's where you know, the dilemma is. Uh, the sea otter, Currently, we don't see them out here. They were once here, as you can see from these posters that have been put up. Um, <clears throat> they were once here. In fact, they, their range extended from basically all the way around the North Pacific Rim, from Japan to Russia to North America, all the way down our continent, all the way to Baja, Mexico. So they had this really broad distribution. Then, as Chairman Saris mentioned, they were hunted. Um, for their pelts. They have some of the softest pelts. Has anybody touched a sea otter pelt in this audience here? It's probably the softest thing you'll ever touch. Um, and so you can understand why maybe their pelts were, were really sought after and prized. Um, but that led to their near extinction. And in here in California, we thought they were actually extinct uh, in the early 1900s. And there was this colony that was found off the coast of Big Sur. There's about 50 animals. And from that, the sea otter population here has expanded to about 3,000. Um, <clears throat> and it's still kind of at this level where there's concern about the population. Um, so today's panel, we're gonna discuss the history of the sea otter here in Northern California. And we're gonna hear from four distinguished panelists. Um, first, Chairman Saris from the Federated Indians of Great Rancheria. Lillian Carswell, who is the director of the Sea Otter Recovery Program for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, Jenna Bentall, who is the director for Sea Otter Savvy. And uh, joining us online, I believe, is Dr. Tim Tinker, who's with Inhydra Consulting and adjunct professor at UC Santa Cruz. You're gonna um, hear about different periods of time and so there's really four main periods of time that we're gonna be discussing. There's gonna be pre-human history or what we call deep history. And this is the evolutionary history of the sea otter that dates back millions of years. 
Then we're gonna hear about first settlers history. And that's you know, basically the last few thousands to 10,000 years. Then we're gonna hear about European um, hunter settler period, which was about 200 years ago. And then we're gonna hear about this most recent period as well, the last 100 years that has been kind of devoid of sea otters. And we were, we've had all the, because of this, this historical accident, we've had a lot of the changes that have occurred on our coast, be it with industry and, and how we humans are interacting um, here with the ocean. Um, <clears throat> so with that said, um, I think it's time to bring up our panelists and we will be discussing the history of sea otters. Panelists, you ready? Okay, great. Um, we're going to first start out with, with Chairman Saris. Um, and Chairman Saris, what do we know about the connection, the historical connection, between sea otters and Native American communities, or more specifically, the connection between sea otters and the Federated Indians of Great Rancheria? Um, this is a two-part question. Secondly, we'd like to know how are sea otters being integrated into the mission of the Federated Indians of Great Rancheria and also your environmental management plans? Um, okay, thank you so much for asking. Um, well, let's, the historical connection, I, I, you, I love scientists. They do these, you know, millenniums and all of this sort of stuff. <laughs> Uh, when, you know, people always say to us, oh, you came down the Bering Straits, and I say, no, but I have my Bering Strait. Um, <laughs> you know, when you're talking 10,000, 12,000, 14,000 years, really, who's counting? Um, so, I mean, we evolved with a changing landscape. The landscape is always changing, <clears throat> consequently, or subsequently, the culture is always emerging. Um, so, what we know about pre-contact relationships with the sea otter is that um, like the Russians, like the early Americans, we liked feeling those pelts too. And we often used them um, and hunted them uh, for uh, cloaks and blankets. So especially the coastal people, where the more inland people used rabbits, the coastal people would use the otter pelts. And um, again, the, the, the landscape was so rich and plentiful, they were quite easy to get. We forget that um, they went up the waterways. So they went up the Russian River, they went up the creeks, and they were, we, there was one time of year principally when we would hunt them, and that's when we were both the otters and people doing the same thing, and that was getting the salmon coming up the rivers and creeks. So again, that, that was easy because the salmon were coming so thick and the otters would be right there, and it was easy, easy to get them. Um, but again, one of the most important things is that we, you know, understood. We just took, obviously, what we needed. Uh, they always used to say the Bodega people here took more, had more pelts and so forth, because the saying goes, it was cold and windy here, and we were weak, so we needed to be warm. Um, but uh, in any event, um, it, it was part of a larger system where we worked together. I mean, when the salmon were running, for instance, there was the sea otter, but there was also grizzly bears <laughs> that were there doing the same thing. So we were all working it out together. Uh, in fact, as I mentioned, there were so many people here, but there were more grizzly bears here than there were people. So uh, we had relationships and so forth. The, the redwoods were so big and dark that uh, the, the so many of the animals, the, the plains animals, the pronghorn and the elk that were on the plains wouldn't go into the redwoods. Um, that made it so easy for the first uh, Europeans to hunt them. They'd actually just chase them to the edge of the redwoods and kill them 
like running buffaloes over a cliff. Um, but anyway, we, we um, had this kind of relationship. I don't know anything about eating them, uh, but I did, they did, the old, I used to hear the old people talk so often about the pelts, that they were the softest pelts, and uh, people would love that, uh, love them. In fact, you'd give gifts of sea otter pelts when you were courting somebody, you'd give it to their parents. It's really interesting, you didn't give much to the person you were courting, you had to give it to their parents. But um, anyway, um, let me move to the second question um, about how does it fit in with our broader mission and environmental stewardship of restoration. Um, jumping back, um, one of the things that we did, we were illegally terminated by the federal government in 1966. Um, and as you know, we uh, I wrote a bill and we got our uh, rights restored um, in 2000, uh, uh, December 27th, uh, two weeks before Clinton went out of office. And um, we weren't going to do gaming. That was true. We were going to try to do other things and organic things. So, you know, uh, cheese factories all came and they wanted to be on our land because they wouldn't have to pay taxes, right? But nobody wanted to have the money to give us land, money for land here. So people began to discuss the C word. And um, I said early on to the, to the council, I said, I'll stay with us. Um, I told all my dad's family, I'll, I'll, say, I'll stay with you, but we have to make sure that whatever we do with whatever opportunity we have, it must be predicated on the ethics of the old people, of the ancestors. That means it must benefit Indian and non-Indian alike. It must be a mission of social justice and environmental stewardship. And I know at the time that sounded very antithetical, um, but I'm happy to say nine and a half years in, we have donated $87 million to those causes. <laughs> Um, we then also did the precedent setting um, agreement with the county, with Tole Park, and now with 27,000 acres of Point Reyes National Seashore, the first in the country, where we're co managing 50 50. Nobody makes a decision without the other. Um, and so, again, it's a great opportunity to use traditional ecological knowledge as we think about these things. Um, and one of the things that I think about, you know, when we consider what to do with our resources and so forth, is how are these things connected to other things? How are they connected to, the, to other environmental programs? How, how, can this be, how can this be sustained? And the problems are immense. People want to go back to the world where there was otters and everywhere like that. That world is gone. The landscape used to be our, our Bible. Um, we, stories were associated with features of the landscape. They became mnemonic pegs on which we hung our culture. And um, those markers are gone. Much of the text is gone. But we do have, all of us here, still have shards of that text to read. And so when we look at, for instance, restoring the elk population at Point Reyes, when we look at restoring the, the sea otters, we think, how do we do this cognizant of the world that we live in today. Because it isn't the way it was. People want to do controlled burning the way we used to do it. Well, you didn't have all the undergrowth that you have now. The world was completely different then because we were managing it. And so what we look at is projects and ways, and we consider how much work it's going to have to be to do these things. What other things are affected? How best can we use our resources to again, step by step, create a sustainable future for ourselves and our kids. Um, and so those are the kinds of things we look at. And um, as we would consider the sea otter or um, here, it would be the same kind of thing. It would be how, how what are we doing here? How, what's the vision? What are the, what are the obstacles? As you mentioned, um, people can't even get abalone anymore. I'm so old, when I was a kid, they were like this, you know, they're gone. And the, even this kelp, I mean, the certain groups of people now are, we used to pick the sea kelp, certain groups of people now are just chopping it right off the rocks and it's not growing back. 
And so what do we do to protect the landscape, the environment, so that there can be otters in it? <clears throat> wow, thank you so much for that, Chairman Saris. Um, we are now gonna move over to Lillian Carswell. Um, <clears throat> and if you don't know Lillian, she's kind of a history buff <laughs> with sea otters, with regards to sea otters. Um, she's, she knows a lot. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna start out with a fun question. Um, <clears throat> and Lillian, I would like um, to pretend that we have a time machine right now. All of us jumped into a time machine and we are transported back to the year 1700. What would it look like out here in Bodega Bay and on the outer coast? Well, I'll take a guess at that. So we know that there were thousands and thousands of sea otters in California. Um, perhaps 20,000, perhaps 30,000, we don't know exactly. Um, the reason we know this is because um, the fur traders kept records of how many pelts they took. So we have some idea of how many sea otters were there. Um, in Bodega Bay, uh, specifically, in 1809, Ivan Kuskov came here, and he left with 2,000 pelts. Um, they may not have all come directly from Bodega Bay, but they came from the surrounding areas. Um, it's records like that that show us that it was a really different world. But part of that world was also the invertebrates. There were abalone, there were sea urchins, there were crabs, there were marine worms. Sea otters <laughs> did not drive them extinct. That's why we have them today. Um, sea otters were part of this web with all of those other organisms. And in fact, they had surprising indirect benefits. So Brent has already told you about some of the um, effects of a keystone species. Um, sea otters reduce the densities of these marine invertebrates, so there were fewer of them around, and most of them were tucked in deep crevices, or you know the clams were under, under the sand, but the um, urchins and the um, abalone were tucked in these deep crevices where sea otters couldn't reach them. And instead of attacking the kelp holdfasts directly, they waited for the drift kelp to fall down into the crevices. And in fact, it's believed that sea otters are responsible for the evolution of large body size in abalone in the North Pacific, precisely because of this effect they have on the marine invertebrates. By protecting the kelp from herbivores that would attack it directly, um, pushing them into the crevices where they waited for the, the things that fell down, they allowed the kelp to reduce its chemical defenses. And when you reduce all those like phytochemicals in the kelp, it's more nutritious, um, and healthful for every single organism that depends on it. <clears throat> Great, thanks. Um, so jumping to more recent history in the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972, um, that law prohibits the take of animals listed under the Protection Act. How can sea otter reintroduction be authorized if take isn't allowed? So great question. So the Marine Mammal Protection Act recognized the ecological role of marine mammals. Um, and it was really a visionary law in that respect. And it mandated the managing agency, so that would be US Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries Service, and together we have jurisdiction over the marine mammals. Um, it mandated us to restore those populations to levels at which they would once again be significant functioning elements of the ecosystems of which they're a part. It wanted us, this, this law directs us to restore the ecological relevance of sea otters. And so it's true that the Marine Mammal Protection Act prohibits take of marine mammals, but it has certain exceptions. And to use those exceptions, you um, obtain a permit. So if uh, reintroduction would be covered under one of those exceptions, the Fish and Wildlife Service would have to obtain a permit before any reintroduction could proceed. Great. Um, Tracy, can I get a time check? Are we good on time? Sure, you're doing well at 9.40. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> one more question, Lillian. Um, how does 
in piggybacking a little bit off Chairman Saris, how does the US Fish and Wildlife Service incorporate traditional ecological knowledge into their management decisions? So we want to make decisions based on the best available information. And one of the most important things we want to do is avoid the problem of shifting baselines. So the problem of shifting baselines arises when we have environmental degradation happening over time, but we have people being born into that situation. So they look around, they grow up with it, they're like, this is totally normal. But they don't know what happened before them. And at a certain point, uh, especially if they're you know, colonizers and they're moving around, they have no historical memory, they have no oral memory, we want to avoid that problem. And so how do we make decisions based on that? We're not trying to go back to the past, but we need to understand the past conditions. We also can't be constrained to the present. So we use written records like the fur trader records. We use archaeological evidence like looking at middens. We use scientific studies that take sediment cores and look at isotopes, which can tell us what's happening. And we rely on traditional ecological knowledge, the stories that have been passed down orally by people who have been here and who have had a continuous presence and passed down that knowledge. Um, that's not to say that we don't care about the present. We absolutely want to understand current impacts as well. And so any process that we would initiate um, would involve multiple opportunities for feedback from people, comments, concerns, questions, information. Uh, we want to understand um, both the historical situation and any um, current impacts that any action we would propose to take. And so part of the reason for this panel, this is sort of like our first toe in the water to even just talk about reintroduction. We want to hear from people what the past was, what the present is, what potential impacts could be. We just want to open a conversation. Um, there's certainly there's no decision. There's no formal um, proposal on the table. This is the beginning of a long conversation. OK, thank you. <clears throat> and so what I'm hearing, I think, that is kind of coming out from this is that perhaps going back to the past, exactly how it was, you know, in 1700 is probably not a possibility. And so um, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be funny. Um, so anyways, <clears throat> so we're going to swift to our uh, shift to Jenna Bental, the director of Sea Otter Savvy, um, who, if you're not aware of, these are the posters that you're seeing around and these awesome um, <clears throat> water bottles that have been passed around come from Sea Otter Savvy. Um, and Sea Otter Savvy has developed an education program based on that slogan, we were here. So Jenna, can you tell us a little bit about how the history of sea otters um, here in Northern California has informed this we were here slogan? Yeah, just to give a little information, background uh, to the We Were Here Sea Otter program. Um, for Sea Otter Savvy, is a nonprofit organization that's focused on research and outreach to both better understand human impacts to sea otters and foster uh, community engagement in their stewardship. And We Were Here was created as an, as an educational component of Sea Otter Savvy to address a perceived gap in awareness that were really becoming, was becoming more noticeable to us in our engagement with the public. And that was, in general, a, a lack of understanding uh, that sea otters once lived on the Northern California coast, and or that if they that they were even missing from the Northern California coast. So, kind of two opposed different um, misconceptions and uh, misunderstanding about their ecological impacts, their history, all these kinds of things. And so, we really developed. We were here as as a way of addressing and providing information to the public about. Um, science-based um, as well as history and uh, the most current information about recovery efforts and also most importantly going back to our community engagement component of Sea Otter Savvy we wanted to provide a platform for those that wanted to participate so there's a survey 
um, public survey on the We Were Here page. If you scan the QR code on our posters, that'll take you right to that page and that survey. And you can, anyone can take it and you can voice your opinion. And many of you have already participated. Thank you so much. And, and um, those, those results from that survey go directly to the people that are involved in the reintroduction process. So um, that's really, really how the foundation of how we got started with that. Great. Um, so I'm going to follow up, up with a question. Why is awareness and engagement with local and broader communities so important in tying together what has happened in the past with regards to sea otters and what might happen in the future? Yeah, so I give a lot of talks uh, about coexistence between humans and sea otters. We work mainly on, on the central coast with recreationists, so it's about we're trying to resolve conflicts over space specifically, um, but we're always talking about coexistence. And I really almost always open every talk I give with three important takeaway points from the history of sea otters. And the first you're gonna hear a lot about, you already have heard a lot about, and that's that there's this tremendous impact, uh, near devastation to this species caused by human actions, without which we would not be sitting in this room today having this discussion. So we're having this because of human actions. Um, the second component that I always like to remind people, you're gonna hear a lot about science, sea otter science, sea otter ecology, keystone species today, and the fragmentation of sea otter populations by hunting is really the reason why we're able to test questions related to ecology and the reason why we have a lot of knowledge about um, sea otter impacts on ecosystems. And so it's kind of a backwards um, way of thinking about that horrible catastrophic event to sea otters because, because that created this fragmentation, the ability to compare populations with and without sea otters, that's why we have the knowledge we have. So I just like to kind of found that in, in um, found our understanding of science in that context. And then finally, um, it's really important to remember, and this seems kind of obvious, Lillian's kind of alluded to it, and Chairman Saros as well, is that sea otters are returning to a coastline that is fundamentally different from the one that they were removed from you know, 200, 100 years ago in terms of human uh, industry, uh, urbanization, development, all of the things. So think about the California coast specifically and all the development that has occurred since 1700 when you know, we can't unfortunately go back in time. And this has created sort of a situation where as they're recovering, they're recovering into places where humans are already established in all of those things, their industry, their, their living, their recreation. And as we have been working in Sea Otter Savvy, we've sort of been having to try to play catch up in the recent history with, in terms of um, already established activities that are having to adapt to sea otters moving in. And so one of the reasons we really feel like it's important to move ahead of that, of that game into Northern California is to kind of get communities already engaged and already working and thinking about what it would be like if sea otters return here, whether it's by natural range expansion or by reintroduction or however that happens, so that we can have communities that are welcome, welcoming them back and are already ready for what it would look, what their world would look like with sea otters here. <clears throat> Great, Th thank you so much, Jenna. Um, <clears throat> and I think, yeah, you know, San Francisco Bay is probably one of those shorelines that we can think of that has changed dramatically, but we know historically is, you know, was the home to probably thousands of sea otters um, in that one bay alone. And what would it look like today? Um, it's hard to, it's hard to say. Okay, so um, our next uh, panelist, I think we're gonna get him on. He, he, he lives in Canada. Um, <laughs> he lives he in Nova Scotia, very far away from us. But um, this is Dr. Tim Tinker, and he is one of the authorities on sea otters, probably in the entire world. Um, <clears throat> and we often lean to Tim, we as the scientific community, lean towards Tim to help us with statistics and, and modeling and um, these kind of high level kind of activities. Um, so based on that, Tim, you are um, using sophisticated models to predict the future. 
of regards to in regards to sea otter recovery um, and recolonization. How much does history um, play into these models and inform these models that are making these really important predictions? Yeah, thanks, Brent. Um, I might have a little bit of echo here, but not too much. So I would, I'm going to answer that by saying mostly, mostly they are not informing, but a little bit they are informing um, models. And I've never thought of my models as being sophisticated, so, so thank you for that. <laughs> so we, we've heard a little bit about history and the historical context um, already from the other panelists. We know, for instance, in deep history, um, we don't know exactly how many sea otters were present at any one time, whether we're talking um, 100,000 years ago or, or 2 million years ago. We know sea otters were there um, from the fossil records. And we also know, as, as uh, I believe Lillian referred to, that they were sufficiently abundant that they had very strong impacts on the rest of the coastal ecosystem all the way around the North Pacific. We know this um, from the evolution of abalone, of um, kelps of macroalgae, even stellar sea cows. We know that sea otters influenced the evolution of the entire ecosystems around that. And so they had to be sufficiently abundant to, uh, to be having those magnitude of effects. Um, but since we don't know those numbers, um, there's not really much point in trying to insert those, uh, any sort of wild guess estimates into a model. Um, more in terms of more recent historical, the, the last 10,000 years, which um, we've heard quite a bit about uh, um, some really insightful thoughts about that from Chairman Cirrus. Um, we do know sea otters were there from traditional um, oral histories and knowledge of the, uh, of the indigenous people that lived here, um, as Chairman Cirrus has uh, uh, informed us, and also from um, tribes up and down the Pacific coast in North America. Um, we know that humans and sea otters coexisted and that there were cultural um, mechanisms or traditions and ways that humans and sea otters were able to coexist over a very, that entire um, length of time. For more than 10,000 years, humans and sea otters were able to coexist. We don't know exactly how many there were, um, but again, we know that there is sufficient abundance that they appear in the midden records um, up and down the coast throughout that entire period. So we do know that they were um, pretty abundant, that they were geographically widespread. And I think the most important thing we know is we have learned, as, as Chairman Saris indicated, humans and otters had figured out how to coexist. And that's really important because that's what we're talking about today. Can humans and sea otters coexist again? We believe they can because they did for a, an awful long time. And then finally, the last little sort of blip in history, the last 200 years since the fur trade, um, that period of time does inform um, the models that I work on um, with, with many other people um, a little bit. Um, we, we know the history of, um, of recolonization of sea otters, both via reintroductions from management um, in British Columbia and Southeast Alaska and other places, and by their natural recolonization in, in many places. We have a fair amount of information, data from those sort of natural experiments as Jenna just alluded to. Um, and we're using as much of that information as we can to help inform our models, how sea otters have recolonized, the rate at which they do that, the types of densities that they achieve in different types of habitats, and even more recently, how they interact with people in these different ecosystems and different contexts. So, so yes, that most recent history is the one that is most data rich. And that is where we are trying to um, use those information to inform our models, but we recognize that that's a very recent history. Um, so we don't, we recognize the information that we're using is not complete yet. Um, we're still learning how sea otters and people um, and ecosystems will coexist. So we don't know exactly what the right numbers are yet, but, um, but we're learning as we go along. Okay, Tim, thank you. Um, one other question. Uh, and you might have already answered some of this, but do you think sea otter recovery efforts will lead to historical levels of sea otters in California? And if so, how long might it take? So that is something we do know something about. Um, again, as mentioned, because we have the example of the last 100 years of, of recovery here in California, um, but also similar sorts of um, 
histories of sea otter recovery and recolonization up and down the uh, Pacific coast of North America and even and throughout the Aleutian Islands and even um, in the, uh, the other side of the Pacific. So that tells us something um, about how sea otters are the populations grow and spread spatially. And one of the most important things we've learned from that period of time is that um, they don't spread very fast. Um, they Obviously, when we reintroduce them um, to a new place, that sort of gives a little bit of a, uh, you know, a space, a jump in, in the process. But because their um, their natural history is highly localized, they tend to, um, individual animals, particularly adults, don't move very far up and down the coast. They're, they're different from other marine mammals in that sense. Um, so they have, they, they think local and they live local. Um, that means that the rate at which their population naturally spreads up a long linear coastline like California um, or Oregon or, or really a lot of the, um, the coast of North America is remarkably slow. Um, it's taken them uh, almost 100 years to just spread from Big Sur up into um, just north of Santa Cruz. Um, it's, so it's a distance that you can you can hop in your car and drive that in you know in a couple of hours. It's taken them about a century to grow that far. And our models are um, when we when we plug in information on what we know about their birth and death rate and their individual movements rate. This actually makes sense. So we can use our models to project forward, how long will it take them um, to get say up to, uh, up to Bodega Bay or Fort Bragg or Eureka um, based on that current natural rate of recolonization and, and range spread? And the answer is a long, long time. I just ran the model actually this morning um, just to have a little bit of information, but really we're looking at based on the, the current rate of range spread that we've observed over the last century probably another 200 years before they achieve historical abundance throughout all of California. Um, and that may sound remarkable, but that's that's based on, that's actually fairly optimistic based on the rate at which they've been spreading. Um, so uh, reintroduction might speed that up somewhat, but it's not gonna speed it up as much as maybe a lot of people think. Um, even if there were you know, 20 to 50 animals released really say in Fort Bragg, it would still be um, another you know, 30 to 40 years before they spread down the coast to Bodega Bay and maybe 50 years before they spread up you know, to the Mendocino area, um, up to Eureka. So it's, uh, it's uh, the perception that if we put a few in Northern California, there's something gonna spread all over California um, also is not consistent with what we know about um, sea otter biology. <clears throat> great, great, Dr. Tinker. Thank you so much for um, videoing in from, from your place in, in Nova Scotia. Um, it's always wow. great to see you and, and be enlightened by your answers. But um, I think the key um, thing that Tim, you know, and I'll just reiterate it, is that if sea otters move up here, it's going to take a really, really long time for them to grow to these levels where they were historically. Um, and so... It's, this is a long process we're talking about, um, and not just something that happens all of a sudden and overnight. You have thousands of sea otters up and down the northern uh, California coast. So that wraps up the first panel um, for today. I want to thank um, all of our panelists um, for your great answers and enlightening um, knowledge of, about sea otters and the system up here. Um, so if we could, everybody give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you to our moderator and our wonderful panelists. And now I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome the moderator of our next panel, Exploring Potential Impacts on Marine and Kelp Ecosystems, Heather Barrett, Science Communications Director and Research Scientist at Sea Otter Savvy. Heather's interest in sea otter conservation and ecology developed through her undergraduate degree at UC Santa Cruz and her internship at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. She also was completed graduate research at Moss Landing Marine Laboratory. And as Science Communications Director for Sea Otter Savvy, Heather refines science communication strategies, oversees creation of promotional science-related materials, 
leads science-related media relations, and develops special projects for outreach that support Sea Otter Savvy's mission. As research scientist, Heather continues her research interests in human disturbance to sea otters and mitigating human sea otter com conflicts. Please join me in welcoming Heather. And Heather, feel free to take a seat. Yeah, that's not a that I meant to tell. <laughs> Hi everyone, and thank you so much Tracy, and thank you um, Representative Hopkins for initiating this summit. Um, as Chairperson Saris mentioned, it is so important to have these open discussions um, and to be inclusive and really have that whole view. So I'm so excited to be here and I'm honored to have been asked to moderate this panel which is exploring potential impacts on marine and kelp ecosystems. The goal of this panel is to give everyone a little bit of a foundation about marine ecosystems here in California, as well as to highlight the potential impacts and influences a sea otter, potential sea otter reintroduction could have on these ecosystems, and touch on questions that we've actually received through our We Were Here Sea Otter survey, as well as through different community and stakeholder representatives. So I'm actually gonna keep this one pretty short because we have a lot of questions to get through, um, but I am joined by Dr. Joshua Smith with the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Richard Ogg, a longtime fisherman here in Bodega Bay, Dr. Brent Hughes, we just met, <laughs> with Sonoma State University, and Dr. Tim Tinker with Anhydra Ecological Research. So I'm gonna ask them to come join me now so we can get started with the long list of questions to get through. I will sit down. <laughs> well, thank you all for being here. And we are going to do it a little bit differently. We're going to kind of jump through each of the panelists for a few different series of questions. Um, but I'm going to start off with you, Richard. It's so good to see you, and it was so good to chat with you earlier. Um, you have had an extensive career in fisheries, and I really wanted to touch on something that we talked about was what being a fisherman meant to you. Um, and can you briefly touch on some of the changes that you've witnessed recently in the coastal habitat locally that's, um, and if there's been any associated impacts to your business that you've seen? To, impacts to what now? Uh, impacts to your business um, okay. in some of the changes that you've seen. Okay, fisherman. well, in terms of uh, a fisherman in general, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty, it's a, <laughs> I have to say it's a it's an incredible industry to be in, and um, the freedom and the the love of the ocean has really been something that has been with me forever. Uh, I've lived in Sonoma County for 62 years, and I've been on the water over 50. And in that time, you know, it's it's given me the opportunity to kind of realize how important it is for us as a, com a commercial industry to be able to provide a resource to the public, you know, that is, you know, belongs to you. And, and we are the, you know, we're really, it, overall we are the conservationists um, that people don't maybe understand uh, a lot about the, our, our perspective. Um, and that, you know, if we don't conserve and take care of the ocean, we don't have a way to make a living. So it's real important that we do the right thing and, and protect the waters and and uh, provide that, that resource to you. Um, the changes that I have seen over the years have been significant in some respects and then in others not not as great. Uh, we've had, you know, temperature changes, water changes, uh, um, species shift that has impacted our ability to access you know, a resource and under many, many conditions. And so we've done our best to be able to, you know, adapt to these situations. Um, but in general, um, you know, it's becoming more and more difficult based you know, on, on what our opportunities are uh, in terms of regulation and environmental changes. So um, I don't know if that answered all the questions or not. <laughs> well, that was, no, that was excellent. Yeah. And I also wanted to ask you, is there 
Is there a question from you or from the fishing community that you feel needs to be addressed in summits like this? Is there something that overarching that you feel needs Regarding to be? this particular uh, situation? Yeah, that okay. potential reintroduction. Uh, I think, you know, in general, um, and this is primarily my perspective, uh, I'm, philosophically, I'm, 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 I'm very much a nature-oriented individual, and um, I, my, my feelings are that nature has its way, and we need to be very cognizant of that, and not, uh, you know, man has a tendency to interfere with many, many situations, and it's very important to look at this holistically and understand that that things will adapt and change in their own methods. And for us to, you know, impose our perspectives and our concepts on these changes that we feel are important, it not in, from my heart, it doesn't feel right. So it's important that I express that in that I, you know, I'm, I question whether this is a, a decision that we should be making or if it's something that nature should make. And I think that's really important to keep in perspective. And um, I also have to say that we have to be very cognizant of unintended consequences. Um, I mean, 30 years ago, we didn't think about microplastics. We didn't think about, you know, things that can impact the environment in a way that, you know, we just didn't expect. And so we have to keep in mind that those unintended consequences can have significant effects on all of us. And so I have my, my questions regarding the, 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 the drive to reestablish something that in time will be here. So um, it's, you know, that's just my perspective, so. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's an excellent perspective, and all your questions are very valid, and that is a very important thing to bring up. So Thank you. <laughs> um, I'll move on to you, Josh, Dr. Smith. Um, there are many questions that came through our survey and from the fishing community focused on urchin barrens, um, the loss of the sunflower sea stars, and how sea otters benefit and impact coastal ecological <coughs> communities. Can you lay some foundation for us by first um, talking about what is an urchin barren? And this was touched on a bit before, but maybe another recap on keystone species and both how the sunflower star and the sea otter fit into the California food web. Yeah, so um, there's, there's a lot of um, terms there and we've, um, we've already heard several today um, like keystone species and um, I, I hope that I can um, unravel some of these um, ecological interactions. And so I'm gonna use um, kelp forests as a way to do that. Um, so kelp forests are um, one of the most productive and biologically significant ecosystems on the planet. Um, and this um, extraordinary biodiversity is in part why these ecosystems are so valued for um, um, things like their um, e economic and ecological and cultural services uh, that they provide. Um, but what can happen sometimes is um, under um, periods of really poor environmental conditions, things like marine heat waves that I'll talk about in a bit, um, or through the loss of predators, um, there can be um, what we call these sea urchin outbreaks. And so sea urchins um, are these grazers in kelp forests that eat the kelp. Um, and, and so um, these sea urchin outbreaks are typically associated with um, the loss of those important, um, what we call ecosystem services. And so these outbreaks um, have happened around the world and, and they're, um, they can occur through things like marine heat waves and also um, through the loss of predators. But some predators um, like uh, sea otters and, and some sea stars, like the sunflower star, um, are um, what we call um, keystone species. And so they can actually um, help to um, keep populations of those sea urchins in check um, thereby having a, an overall positive benefit um, on, on kelp forests. Okay, excellent, thank you. And then a follow-up question to that is, can you share a bit about your research? So how did the marine heat wave of 2016 impact kelp communities in central 
and Northern California, and why are we seeing a difference in kelp growth and resiliency between these two regions? Yeah, so um, kelp forests over the last 10 years or so have um, really taken a big hit. Um, and um, it's actually been um, now 10 years since this sea star wasting syndrome occurred um, that just completely decimated several different species of sea stars from Alaska to Baja. And one species that was hit um, particularly hard is the sunflower sea star, um, which is a known predator of sea urchins. The year after, so this, that, that occurred back in 2013. Then from 2014 into 2016, um, there was this marine heat wave that occurred, um, which, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, this heat wave created really poor environmental conditions for um, kelp productivity. And so um, as a result of, of those perturbations, what we saw up and down the coast um, were these sea urchin outbreaks. Um, and in places like Sonoma and Mendocino in Northern California, these um, outbreaks of sea urchins were widespread. Um, and, and we literally saw um, hundreds of kilometers of coastline become um, deforested. Um, but in places like Central California um, in Monterey Bay, um, what, what happened instead is that there was actually this formation of a mosaic of these emergent sea urchin barrens interspersed with these remnant patches of kelp forests that have um, persisted this entire time. So um, our um, research group um, looked into this um, and we were um, tracking sort of what was going on underwater on the reef surface with kelp and urchins. Um, and then also looking at how this may have changed um, um, patterns in, in sea otter foraging and what this ultimately means for the, the fate of kelp forests. Um, and so um, people have um, known this for a long time, but on once these barrens develop, um, the condition of those sea urchins that, that eat the kelp really declines. Um, and so um, in the kelp forest, though, the urchins are really healthy. And so um, that's why urchins are, um, of course, um, harvested and, and um, their, their uni or their row um, is, is what um, um, is that energetic part of the sea urchin in, in kelp forest. But in the barrens, these urchins are completely starved out. And you open them up and there's nothing inside of them. And it's remarkable that these animals can live in that starved state in these barrens for many, many years. And so that's what creates these challenges for kelp recovery at those places. So interestingly, um, it turns out that sea otters, um, and again, I'm, I'm talking about the, the Monterey Peninsula here, um, where uh, this sea urchin outbreak happened in a place where otters had been um, um, pretty well established for the last several decades. Um, and it turns out that the otters actually cued in on those really healthy urchins in the patches of kelp forests. Um, and so um, otters really stepped up their foraging on sea urchins, but, but again, restricted to these patches of kelp. And so what that means though, is that um, it, it seems that at least the persistence of kelp forests um, in Central California along the Monterey Peninsula is owed in part to um, this really intense sea otter foraging in those patches of kelp forests. Thank you. Okay, that's really interesting. Um, we're now going to head to Dr. Hughes. So piggybacking off to Dr. Smith's answer, what are some of the changes you're noticing in Northern California kelp habitats through your current research? Yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, so yeah, my lab at Sonoma State University, we're heavily engaged in kind of these big questions of marine ecosystems and what, you know, what are the key drivers of resilience and persistence? And so, uh, and what can we as humans do about it in terms of management and restoration? So with that kind of two pronged approach and, and, and goals for conducting our research, we know that in the last 10 years, just as Dr. Smith has mentioned, there's been an almost in complete decline of, of kelp forest here in Northern California. And we're primarily talking about one species of kelp. This is the bull kelp, Neriocystis leucaeana. And it's an annual kelp. It's, it's 
pretty iconic for a kelp species because it grows about a foot a day. Um, so it has these tremendous growth rates, but um, like a lot of kelp, it's, it is kind of um, when urchins are not left um, checked by predators, it can get wiped out pretty quick. Um, <clears throat> so there, there was about a 90% decline in kelp um, along the Northern California coast. And what our lab has done is not focus on those areas, we focus on the area that 10% that still remains. Um, because that's where we think the interesting stuff happens. And what can we learn from that? And how can we, how can we apply that to kelp forest restoration? And so um, <clears throat> what we've been finding is that it, without these predators around the sea stars, sea otters, um, how does a kelp forest thrive in Northern California? What we've have been finding is that the kelp that has persisted, a lot of it is, are around river mouths, estuaries where you get a lot of fresh water flow. And oftentimes we kind of ignore estuaries and you know, if you're a kelp forest ecologist, you ignore the estuary. And if you're an estuary ecologist, you ignore the kelp forest. I'm this weird person who likes to work in both. And so um, these connections, these freshwater connections seem to be really, really important. Um, and we, what we've noticed is that in these areas around these coastal confluences where we still have persistent kelp, um, are often very, vo very low in urchin numbers. And we think there's something that's going on with the environmental conditions that um, are not very suitable for the urchins, but are very suitable for bull kelp. And, you know, bull kelp, you'll find it in very freshwater areas, especially if you go up, you know, near Seattle and Puget Sound, you'll, you know, there will, it will be very, very low salinities and you'll find thriving kelp forests. Um, so we've been making that connection. The second thing we're doing is that we're trying to develop restoration programs up here in Northern California. So we can be better prepared if there's another heat wave or you know, the sea stars never come back. You know, what, what are we as humans gonna be able to do about that? And so my lab, um, we're very focused on the vegetation side of things. And so we culture kelp in a lab, actually, the lab is just right over there in Bodega Marine Lab. Um, we culture the kelp, we grow it on weird things like twine. Um, <clears throat> and we, we've been growing this kelp um, in the lab, growing it on twine and different surfaces like rock where we put it back out into the ocean. So it's like underwater gardening. Um, <clears throat> and there's, we've been now this, with our partners, this restoration work has really expanded from Marin County to Sonoma to Mendocino. Um, and so we are now partnering with um, commercial urchin divers, which kind of adds this one-two punch for the, for the um, restoration, where the urchin, commercial urchin divers remove the urchins and we go in there and plant them after the urchins have been removed. However, you know, there are areas like Marin County where we're, we're restoring kelp um, off the coast of Point Reyes where we do not want to dive um, because we don't want to get eaten by sharks. And so <laughs> what we do is we wrap our twine around bricks and throw it overboard. So, you know, if we relate this back to the sea otter, um, what we know has been happening with the sea otter that has been limiting their recovery is because they can't get past these great white shark gauntlets that exist, such as around Point Reyes. Um, and because of that, we don't, you know, putting sea otters in that an area like that with a ton of white sharks might not be the best idea for sea otter recovery. But, you know, sea otters could do the work for us in other places where, you know, urchin, we are doing the urchin removals. Um, and so there could be value in that in terms of um, enhancing restoration. And so, um, yeah, I'll okay, end there. I'm gonna follow up okay. question for you with that. So you've touched on sort of the kelp restoration work that you're doing in the different areas up along the Northern California coast. Um, do you, are there any costs and benefits associated with long-term kelp restoration efforts and, and sort of would sea otters hinder or assist that restoration? You maybe touched on that one just a little bit, but. Yeah, and, I, I, and so that, that, that is the deal. I think every place we're doing restoration is unique. And there's not one recipe that works for every single site. Um, and so, like I mentioned, Marin and like in Marin County, 
um, you know, the sea otter might not work so well in the in that sort of restoration context because they are also fearful of white sharks and they know when white sharks are around and will avoid those areas. They're smart animals. Um, <clears throat> so an area like that, yeah, probably not much benefit from the sea otter. But these areas where it's just a loaded urchin barren um, and we're trying to maybe restore new areas, the sea otter could have some value to that. Okay. And yeah. are there long-term cost benefits to restoration of kelp through time? even just from humans versus sea otters involved? I mean, yeah, so we're, I mean, right now we're just trying to protect that remaining 10%, right? And we're coming up, developing strategies on how to best use our human resources to protect what is still there. Um, we're looking at ways of maybe regenerating kelp in, in areas where it's been totally lost. Um, but right now we are really just, we're aiming to protect what's there and building out those areas with restoration. So, yeah. Thank you. So now we're going to head to Dr. Tim Tinker, who I think is back up on the screen or will be shortly. Um, there you are. Hi, Tim. <laughs> when we chatted previously, you touched on how there are some misconceptions that do surround sea otter reintroduction with relation to timing. I know you just sort of touched on this with Brent as well, um, but I'm hoping maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on this timing of species recovery into a habitat in California specifically, since a lot of people have asked questions about Alaska in relation to that, and how the effects of sea otters um, on their ecological community change over time. Right, okay, yeah, so there, one thing that is um, a lot of people, particularly people who live in coastal communities, um, sort of have heard about sea otters. Um, this is communities where sea otters are not present now, but, but maybe either being gonna be reintroduced or gonna spread naturally. They hear stories that sea otters are gonna have these huge impacts on certain types of fisheries, particularly obviously invertebrate fisheries, um, whether that's for urchins, um, for certain types of clams or crabs. Um, and from what we've been hearing from, um, from all the panelists, that, that makes sense in a way because we know sea otters do have these disproportionately large impacts on our ecosystems. Um, but there's a lot of variation and there's a lot of context that's important and that is sometimes glossed over. One of the, those contexts has to do with um, where the population is coming from or how it's being re reintroduced. So many of, for instance, of the stories, that's, the, the horror stories or the scary stories that people tell about sort of impacts of sea otters are coming from places like Southeast Alaska where the population has built up over many, many, many decades um, until it's, it's a fairly large population. And then when a group of sea otters sort of enters a new habitat or moves around a point into a new stretch of coastline, uh, it's often a very large group of otters, usually this a, trans, a group of, um, of male otters, sometimes hundreds, sometimes even the thousands of animals that appear really suddenly. And that magnitude of, uh, of sea otters, each one of them eating you know, a quarter of their body mass a day does have a really rapid um, effect on, certain, on whatever prey that they're eating. And often that is sort of the largest sea urchins or um, certain types of prey that, that if there are commercial fishery for that, they're gonna have a very big impact. Now, I wanna contrast that with say another place in Southern California where sea otters were reintroduced and where the population, they initially reintroduced the population shrunk down to about 12 animals, about a dozen animals. So a small reintroduced population and 30 years after that reintroduction, they were still, they were beginning to have an impact on certain invertebrates around part of this island. And this is um, a, a lot of people, uh, other panelists here spent a lot of time in this island, San Nicolas Island. Um, and the difference between those two scenarios is just, is vast. Um, and it really just has to do with how, uh, well, the, the population size, how many otters are moving into a new area um, and what the context is for that. So th that context is really important and, and should not be glossed over. If a small number of otters were introduced into somewhere in Northern California, for instance, that, that population would grow over time and, and eventually it would have these the types of ecological effects that we've been hearing about. Um, some of those are gonna um, be perceived as 
negative by some, some communities and some and many of them are going to be perceived as positive um, by some of the same communities or different communities. Um, they will have these effects, but they're not going to be immediate. Um, and that's simply because of just the numbers of animals. There's, there's not going to be suddenly um, 2,000 otters in, in, you know, in the, along the Mendocino coast. Um, that's just, it's impossible. It is not consistent with CR biology. So it's important to sort of understand that context um, and that these changes are going to take time depending on you know, how many otters are reintroduced and, and how that, and where they're reintroduced to. So um, I, is that what you were asking? Yeah, definitely. Thank you for clarifying that. And then my follow-up with you, which is another big question. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> this is an area of concern. Um, is sea otter reintroduction's impact onto the different fisheries, which you just sort of mentioned? And we do receive a lot of questions on sea otter diet preference. So are you able to touch on um, how sea otters might impact urchins versus abalone versus crabs versus fin fish? Um, you have some time for this one. So, <laughs> And are there negative ramifications to biodiversity with a sea otter reintroduction? Oh, boy. Well, so those are, there are many, many, many papers written. I know. <laughs> um, yeah, so those are big subjects. Mm -hmm. So certainly, I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll start with that, um, <laughs> with a very simple statement. Sea otters have had effect on shell fisheries, on certain shell fisheries in certain areas. And I just mentioned some examples in Southeast Alaska. Um, and that's, again, a, a context where you have a very large population of otters spreading in a new habitat. But nonetheless, it's because otters tend to eat um, the largest individuals of um, the most energetically profitable for them, profitable prey that are available, um, that those are often uh, the types of um, species that there are also commercial or recreational fisheries for. Um, so that might be large sea urchins um, or large gooey duck clams or lar large dungeness crabs. The nature of how sea otters affect those populations though is different in every single case. It really depends on the natural history of those species. So I would say there's certain types of shellfish um, that otters can have sort of the most rapid and dramatic effects are. And, and Josh um, and Brent both just alluded to this and that's urchins. That's because urchins tend to change their behavior dramatically when otters are present. Um, when otters are not present, there's a, the urchins tend to be out in the open and are often grazing kelp actively. Um, this makes them easier to find. When otters enter a system, um, there's, they eat a lot of urchins, but also the urchins fund very rapidly change their behavior um, because they don't like getting eaten. And so that makes them a lot harder to find for, say, fishermen who are also um, targeting that species. So, so there are certain fishery, certain shellfish like that, that there can be a larger effect. Other things like Dungeness crab, it's a lot more complex. Otters certainly do like eating large crabs. Um, in fact, they, there's some examples in, um, in, in Brent's uh, graduate work focused on an example in an estuary where um, otters' preference for large crabs had very important ecosystem effects. Um, but for species like Dungeness um, crabs, they spend a lot of their life um, cycle in very deep waters that otters either can't dive to or, or rarely dive to. Um, and, and that gives them this sort of protection, this um, depth protection. Um, so otters can have effects on crabs in, at certain times of their life cycle when they come into shallow waters. But um, we haven't seen um, in California or other places actually uh, evidence that otters have the ability to really have strong negative impacts on Dungeness fishery, uh, crab fisheries. Um, and again, it just has to do with even though otters do like eating them, um, it has to do with their, their life cycle um, and their natural history. Um, and that applies to other species as well. So it, you really kind of have to um, look on a case-by-case on a -case basis and, and un, you know, <laughs> think, think about the life histories involved and, um, and also sort of how otter diets change over time. This is another important thing. What otters eat when they first move into a new area is going to be very different than what they eat 10 years later or 20 years later, as the ecosystem and the food web adapts to otter, sea otters' presence. Um, uh, some work done in Alaska, for instance, found that otters were initially eating commercially important um, shellfish uh, in Southeast Alaska, but 20 years later, almost none of their diet um, contained um, commercially important species. They were at that point focusing on a lot of small invertebrates um, that occurred in kelp forests. Uh, so, so otter diets change over time as well. 
And that's another one of the sort of misunderstandings is that what people see in the first five to 10 years after otters move into a new area is sort of going to define what the long term looks like. And, and from what we've seen, that is not the case. Thank you. You just highlighted some of the intense complexity <laughs> of all of that. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go back to Richard. Um, I think it was just sort of noted how important it is that fishery, each fishery is really unique. Um, can you briefly touch on how the commercial crab, crab fishery operates, local versus large scale, and what are the average depths most commercial fishermen are fishing in? Um, the commercial industry, the commercial crab industry, we can vary depth-wise from eight fathoms to 90 fathoms. It just depends. Mm -hmm. A fathom six feet, so that everybody understands that. Um, the, you know, overall impact, I, you know, thinking about exactly what was just said in that, you know, I don't, I, I personally don't believe that it would be significant. I mean, they, the, the depths that the, the dungeons are at will probably be something, and they will learn to, mm -hmm. to, to avoid the situation. My real question, though, I mean, I have some questions that I'd like to ask. Um, <laughs> um, I'm wondering why we're doing this. <laughs> why, why, why is this, what, what's the emphasis behind, or the impetus behind this? What, and, and, you know, regarding the kelp, it's interesting, you know, to see um, as fishermen, you know, we've watched the kelp disappear and return, disappear and return, and the heat wave had a significant effect on, on that kelp. Um, my question is, again, what is our end goal here? What are we trying to do? So, I mean, I'm kind of changing this around. I'm sorry, but, it's okay. <laughs> you know, I, I'm just at kind of a loss in some respects uh, because I don't, you know, I don't really feel right now that the, you know, the m my particular industries, you know, the salmon, the crab, the black cod, the rockfish, you know, I don't see that having, there, there being a large impact in this, particular thing occurring, but I'm just wondering why. Do one of you guys want to answer, answer that? that? <laughs> Sorry, we throw, I know there's going to be a big question Q&A at the end too, right, uh, but, but they, do you want to start know, the I mean, conversation? I'm just, and, I'm just at a loss. Yeah, I, you do you want to? Let's give it a shot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, you know, in, the, in terms of, and I'm just going to speak from like an ecosystem perspective, um, in biodiversity perspective, um, what we've seen happen in the last, well, if we include the history, um, the loss of, you know, an iconic predator, um, now we have the loss of, um, if you can consider the sunflower star uh, an iconic predator, which a lot of people do in California, there's another one, and then almost a total deforestation event. And so um, for us as ecologists, you know, we look at this and you might step back and be like, well, is this an extinction event? Like, what, is, what do we call this event and what do we do to, you know, <clears throat> do what we can right now to stop, you know, any, any further destruction and then think about the future in terms of climate change and um, what Northern California might look like in 20 or 30 years. And I think it comes down to like, well, what do we want it to look like? And um, and for me, as a I'll putting the conservation biologist hat on, it's you know having sustainable fisheries, and, and I think we've been mentioning the coexistence of humans from different various groups, um, and ho you know hopefully a, a thriving kelp forest. And you know I I, th I think a lot of people might look at the kelp forest here and not think much of it because it's underwater. But it's, it's what I tell my students, it's like, well, let's pretend somebody just went out and, and clear cut all the redwood trees right now. Um, it's, it's pretty similar in my mind. Um, so, and, and, but I'm one person, one perspective, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not gonna uh, carry on with this, but I, that's just kind of my viewpoint. 
Thank you, Brent, and thank you for asking that question. I do think that maybe at the end, Tracy, I know that there's cards, maybe there's a way to kind of bring that question back up to the whole panel, because I think everyone will be able, not just one panelist, but all the panelists, that would be great, so we can make sure that that discussion Sorry, happens. No, <laughs> I think that's an excellent you know. question. So it'll be good, though, to have all the panelists up here, right. so that way everyone can have that big discussion together. Um, and then I'm going to go back to Dr. Smith. So you touched on how sea otters have helped to dampen the effects of kelp loss and reduce urchin variants in regions with sea otters like Monterey. But we do have Northern California communities wondering why is there still some kelp loss in Central California? If sea otters um, were to be reintroduced into Northern California, how might this impact kelp resiliency even if there's potential for future marine heat waves? So the greatest amount of kelp loss in Central California um, occurred during the marine heat wave from 2014 into 2016. Um, and then it continued for a few years after that. Um, and um, I think it's, it's like, that's not um, particularly surprising. I mean, um, there's no reason to believe that the community or ecological communities should recover overnight to this extreme environmental um, event that occurred. Um, and so, um, you know, we've continued to see um, kelp forest loss. However, I, I do want to emphasize that at least in Central California, there are these remnant patches of um, kelp forests that have persisted this entire time. And um, what's so important about that um, is thinking about the eventual recovery of the system. Um, that kelp, or replenishing those barrens with kelp, that, that source kelp has to come from somewhere. So. Um, on the central coast where there's, there's this mosaic of sea urchin barrens and these remnant patches of kelp forests, those remnant patches of kelp forests are the ultimate spore sources to help replenish those, um, those barren grounds. Um, the other thing too um, that I thought of that um, I, I think, um, it, Tim mentioned this earlier and I think it comes up to the previous question, it, it sort of addresses the previous question is that um, contexts are really important, um, and Northern California is um, similar but, but different in ways than Central California. The, these are traditionally bull kelp dominated forests. In Central California, we're talking about um, uh, macrocystis, which is a different kind of kelp. Um, we heard a bit about um, San Nicolas Island earlier. Um, what's really interesting about Central California is um, this may be um, one of a few examples of where an urchin outbreak happened at a location where um, sea otters um, were pretty well established. Um, but again, that, um, that response by the sea otters to target urchins in patches of kelp forests helped to um, facilitate the resistance of those kelp forests to further um, overgrazing by sea urchins. There's yet uh, one more example um, of the opposite of this. Um, up in the Aleutian Islands, where um, after otters were hunted from these islands, the urchins took over, because they no longer had a predator, um, and transformed these islands into these barrens. But then once otters recovered to those islands, they ate the urchins and the kelp came back. Um, so those, I think, are a couple um, examples that um, you know, we can draw from of sort of both sides of the coin of how an urchin outbreak happened in a place where there were sea otters and also how sea otters um, influenced the recovery of a forest by um, repatriating an area that they were hunted from. Thank you. And then Dr. Hughes, we're gonna go back to you. Um, sort of with just discussing resiliency, um, I'd also like to talk a little bit about climate change and how a keystone species like sea otters can dampen some of these effects. And can you also touch on how sea otters influence salt marshes and eelgrass communities? You mentioned that's a, an area that you like to, to research as well. How do sea otters use estuaries? In what ways do they impact surrounding ecological communities? Yeah, so it turns out um, <clears throat> that the, the majority of this discussion today has been on kelp forests, but we also know that sea otters like to use estuaries too, um, and that they can play these really important roles in the estuary, um, in particular protecting other types of vegetation, like seagrass in salt marshes. And the a lot of, you know, the general public doesn't think so much about seagrasses. Again, it's this habitat that you can't really see. Um, so you, you don't even know it's there, but it's, you know, they kind of create these mini kelp forests almost. 
and they're really important for fisheries. Um, they're nursery habitats, and so the little baby fish that go offshore in the Dungeness crab, um, they spend their time in estuaries before they move out. And so what we've been finding is that sea otters are play a keystone role in seagrass beds and potentially salt marshes as well. Um, and it's through a totally different pathway that does not even involve urchins at all. It really involves crabs and a little bit of uh, clams. Um, and so what we're finding is that by sea otters eating um, dungeness like crab, the like red rock crabs that you find in estuaries, um, it generates this cascade of events where you get healthier, uh, more thriving seagrass beds. And we've seen this not only in, in California, central California, but we've started to see these patterns emerge in, in Alaska, British Columbia, and where sea otters are using, spending a lot of time in the kelp forest, but also they're spending a lot of time in the seagrass beds. And <clears throat> the seagrass beds and, and also the salt marshes um, the, and the estuary themselves can provide this really important refugia. So when things go bad on the outer coast, be it great white sharks, killer whales, heat waves, big storm events, the, the estuaries seem to provide this really, really important refuge um, for the sea otter. And <clears throat> as we're kind of, you know, the sea otter here, at least in California, has been benefiting um, to some degree from protection um, in certain areas, like marine protected areas, where we're seeing them actually expand out. And Chairman Saris isn't here, but his, his story about the sea otters moving up rivers, it's actually very consistent to what we're seeing now. With their protection, we're seeing them move up into brackish water areas far away from the ocean, you know, tens of kilometers away from the ocean. Um, moving onto salt marshes, hauling out, eating all the little crabs in the salt marsh, which these crabs that, that live in the salt marsh, they, if they're not checked by predators, they, um, they'll eat the actual roots of the salt marsh, and then they'll burrow in the salt marsh and create kind of the Swiss cheese effect in the marsh, which um, really makes the marsh susceptible to erosion and the effects of sea level rise. And so... Um, we, and this is kind of newer information, we think the sea otter might actually play a really important role there. And so there are the, I think the point here is that there, there are these other ecosystems and habitats that are may, probably just as important as the kelp forest is for the sea otter. And these habitats, there are plenty of them up here in Northern California, such as Bodega Bay right here. Um, so yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Brent. I, we only have a couple minutes, but Tim, I do have one last question for you. <laughs> um, so, so we just sort of talked about two different habitat types, and habitat and site selection is incredibly important um, with any potential reintroduction. What makes a potential reintroduction site appropriate for a sea otter, and how do you determine this? Are there criteria? Are you there, Tim? Uh, I'm here. There you are. Oh, there I am. Yeah, so... So that's a, that's a great question, <laughs> another complex one. Um, and and I, I guess the criteria depend a lot on, um, on what Nick raised, what are the goals um, of a reintroduction? So if one were reintroducing say sea otters with the goal of having say positive ecological effects in estuaries, then, then one would be looking at estuaries as potential um, release sites. Um, another one of the criteria that um, people look at is wanting to make sure that if there is a reintroduction that it's successful um, in the sense that you don't spend a lot of time and effort and money um, reintroducing sea otters and then the population goes extinct in, in 10 years. So, so viability of the, the actual reintroduced sea otter population is another one of the criteria that um, the people would like to look at. Um, and there are, we can do a lot of work with, uh, um, with modeling because we have a lot of information on how the relative sea otter abundance and population dynamics in different types of habitats. So we can run simulations, for instance, in an estuary or a stretch of open coast um, based on what we know about the habitat, about the different prey species that are present um, to, um, to compare different potential sites in terms of their likelihood of supporting a, 
you know, a sustainable population of sea otters. But I, again, I, I reiterate that is that's just one of the criteria. Um, and I think as as a number of the speakers have um, have been have sort of raising this point that we really should not or do not want to be looking at this as sort of a single species sort of um, challenge. It's really a much more holistic ecosystem or socio-ecological um, sort of um, project that's being considered. And, and that being the case, many of the criteria that should be looked at will be um, potential ecological benefits and, and also potentially um, minimizing negative social or economic um, impacts uh, of sea otters. So for instance, if there, you knew that there was a particular type of fishery that might be negatively impacted by sea otters that was centered you know, on a certain stretch of coast, one might want to um, avoid having that be the, um, the location of a, a reintroduction. So, so really there's, I mean, there's a suite of different criteria ranging from sort of the cultural, the so, um, socioeconomic to the ecological, um, the types of ecological effects that sea otters have and where they may be beneficial to people um, in different types of habitats. And then finally sort of that, those demographic criteria, um, where are we most likely to um, see a viable population of sea otters uh, over the long term? Do, and also to, there, there's sort of broader uh, demographic ones as well. And that has to do with uh, reestablishing genetic connectivity between Southern sea otters um, and Northern sea otters, which currently the Southern um, range edge of Southern sea, of Northern sea otters is in um, uh, near the South end or getting closer to the south end of Washington state. Um, and then there's this big stretch of no sea otters um, until you get to right now about Half Moon Bay or Pigeon Point um, where you pick up the distribution of southern sea otters. And that massive break is sort of, um, well, it's completely broken any uh, potential genet genetic connectivity. And as a result, southern sea otters have a very low level of genetic diversity and reestablishing that demographic connectivity of populations over the long term. Um, you know, we're not talking about next year or, or the next 10 years, but, but reestablishing that is gonna be um, very important from sort of a, um, a, a large, broader scale um, conservation perspective of reestablishing not only the ecological um, effects of sea otters, but also the genetic um, demographic connectivity that will allow it to have healthy um, genetically diverse populations um, over the longer term. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tim. I believe our time is up. So I would like to thank all of the panelists from this panel. And to remind everyone, if there were questions that didn't quite get to, um, you want to be asked, make sure you can add them onto the sheet that's at the center of the table. Thank you all. So um, we are going to rewind about two hours. And those of you who know me um, know that I often am the kind of person who just jumps right in and tries to start getting to business. Um, so I realized that I never actually introduced myself earlier. Um, <laughs> hi, my name is Linda Hopkins. I am the fifth district supervisor for the county of Sonoma. And it is my honor and privilege to represent all 55 miles of the gorgeous Sonoma coastline. Um, and as I described earlier, I am very honored to have the opportunity to work in partnership with two tribes on the Sonoma Coast. You heard from Chairman Saris earlier, and I am pleased um, to report that Chairman Franklin actually is able to join us today. And so he will be giving um, a welcome and a little bit of information about not only the Kashaya people, um, but also sort of the history with respect to otters on the North Sonoma Coast. Um, I have learned so much from Chairman Franklin. Um, he has taught me, in, I mean, I, I have so much still to learn, and yet he really embodies the commitment of literally tens of thousands of years of stewardship of land and community. Um, and we are extraordinarily lucky to have him at the local level. I happen to know that DC keeps trying to pull him away from Sonoma County, um, but his heart is in his home and his homeland. And he is a tremendous advocate and representative, not only for the Kashaya people, but really everyone who has the opportunity to come to the Sonoma coast. Um, and I do wanna say you have daughters, so you know 
how this goes. My 10-year-old doesn't think very much of what I do is cool, um, but she went to Fort Ross and learned, and she was thought it was very cool that I could know you and consider you a friend. So thank you for that bonus to uh, my 10-year-old daughter. Um, please welcome and join me in a round of applause for Chairman Franklin. Thank you so much. You want me at the table or the podium? Oh, you got the pulpit. Oh, yes. right on. I got the pulpit. I'm going to preach. Hope you all are ready. <laughs> um, great. Well, always good to see you. Uh, it's always good to be back home. I've been uh, in the last four weeks, uh, five weeks in Connecticut, uh, back to D.C., and then uh, up in Alaska, down to Phoenix, which technically is hell as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> And then, uh, and then over to Oklahoma and then Kansas uh, and then got back here Tuesday. So uh, pardon for being a little tardy, uh, but my life is crazy and that's just the way it goes uh, when you're a tribal chairman and a health board chair and do all the things that I'm asked to do on behalf of the country and the president as well as uh, Indian country. So, and my Iwa, Toshis Chima, and the Reno County Franklin, uh, tribal chairman of the Kushaya Pomo tribe. Um, Obama appointee to the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, uh, a post that I uh, am still in uh, on my third administration, which is kind of weird. Um, and, uh, and, and as uh, my good friend said, also a father of daughters, uh, twin daughters, who are 16 and do nothing but judge their father. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, uh, this, is, uh, this is something that's a little, little more close to the heart for me. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a Kashaya perspective of, of you know, Kamos um, Awashke is uh, our, our word for our little sea otters, which are good friends of ours. Um, and, uh, but first, I want to address one question. And the question was asked, why now and why are we doing this? And my entire talk is going to be about why now and why we're going to do this, not why should we do this because Kashaya will do it. In 1812, we had our first experience with non-Indian people. Kashaya's lands are just that, very strict about our land. And uh, the ceremonies that we do, unlike our brothers and sisters up in the north, we don't do world healing ceremonies. Um, what Yurok does for Yurok is is awesome. What they do for the rest of us is even better. But Kashaya religion doesn't allow that, and that we can't dictate for others what is sacred. And in turn, nobody dictates for Kashaya what is sacred. So we are not allowed to do the world perspective the way some of these other tribes do. So to have these people come, the undersea people, which, uh, you know, if you can imagine looking out at that ocean for thousands and thousands of years, that nice straight line, and all of a sudden in the distance you see something getting bigger. And bigger and bigger. What in the hell is that? I mean, what are these people? What is this foolish language they're speaking to us? You know, and it was the Russians coming up, and um, with them came the Alaska natives. So why why are we going to introduce otters and my coast now? Because the Russians came, and they hunted our otters into extinction in Kashaya's lands, and they were aggressive. They came down here and wiped out for, for Greg and, and the, the Coast Miwok people. Um, some of the best clam beds in the entire world just completely wiped them out. And why now is a, is a question that's important with an answer that's even more important. Why now is because for 150 or so years, um, the Kashaya people harbored resentment towards the Alaska Native people. Um, after the Russians were here for around 40 or so years, Kashaya signed a treaty. We allowed them to build uh, the fort there, Fort Ross, on our village of Matini. And, uh, you know, their, their purpose for coming down, like everybody else, was how am I going to make money off this land and off this ocean? And sea otters, sea otters were up. They were up, you know. They tried hay, and Kashaya people would get really tired of the Russians and just burn their hay down, you know. And, and they tried, you know, breeding horses and that kind of stuff, and we'd get tired of the Russians and kill their horses. And, uh, you know, it's something you can do when there's 24,000 of you and about 200 of them. That's just numbers game, right? So, unfortunately, 
the sea otters were the ones that suffered. And with that, um, left a huge hole in Kashaya's culture, um, our way of life, our, our life ways. And, uh, and, and like I said, we were upset, rightfully so, at these Alaska natives that came down as the hunters, as the hitmen, so to speak, for these little otters that are out there playing around. It wasn't a good time to be an otter. Um, in about 2012, the Alaska natives contacted us. And, and when, when they left, um, they married into our tribe. So we have several Kashaya people that married Russians and married uh, Alaska natives and went back home with them. Um, so in about 2012, they contacted us and they, uh, they asked us, uh, if they could come and, uh, put on an event at our village. And so, uh, initially we were kind of reluctant, you know, you otter killing mofos, you know, you want to come back and, you know, like how dare, but, uh, but they're good people, you know, and, uh, and they, they, they asked in the right way. Let's just say that. So we met them down, down there at, at, at just at the at the fort right there on, on the water. Um, and they, they came in and they're paddled, paddled in and asked for permission to come ashore. And we granted it. And it started uh, an era of communication between the two of us. We didn't know that the Russians actually had forced them to come down and held their families. And if they didn't meet their quotas, it would murder their families back up in Alaska. And you know um, the reason why they had to do the things they did to uh, to our otter population and our clam population and several others um, was because if they didn't, um, those Russians would murder their families, murder their kids, murder their wives, rape and pillage the same way that these missions did. So we forgave them. And with forgiveness comes goodness. So we forgave them shortly after that. Um, you know, things that were prophesied in Kishaya started to come come to fruition. First, uh, with that forgiveness, um, a year later, our elk returned. We didn't tell anybody because we love, we love the non-native families that live by us, the Richardsons. These guys like might as well be Kashaya people at this point, you know. They've just always, they've known us forever. But there's some yahoos out there with guns that we were like, well, we better keep the elk quiet so nobody goes out and, and kills it. So that guy came down, he went back home, picked up his 20 favorite wives and he came back down. Next thing you know, we have an elk herd living uh, right next to our, or actually partially on our trust land, on the reservation. The porcupines came back. Burrowing owls came back. Uh, much to the displeasure of the local farmers who we like and know and love, uh, the badgers came back and started eating their sheep. But, you know, if they weren't tasty, they wouldn't get eaten. So, uh, so there was a number of, of land animals that started to come back. So, so, so why now? Why now, Jared? Why now goes back to forgiveness. Why now goes back to prophecy. Shortly after that, Kashai got our coastal land back, something that you took part in, and, uh, and named it the Kashai Coastal Reserve. We have a mile of ocean front property, goes into the ocean, goes all the way up to the ridge top, and we've decided to use that as a way to gauge our ocean health and how to better invest our tribal traditional knowledge, pair it with that scientific knowledge, and get away from the friction that exists between science and culture and find ways to bridge that gap. And we've done that very successfully, very successfully at the Coastal Reserve. Um, and in the, the pattern of forgiveness and the pattern of things that are meant to be, all of a sudden we're having this conversation, which started a few years ago for us. And while we've put our attention on the above forest, the below forest is no different for us. You see, in Kashaya way, we have this thing, it's called the law of reciprocity. Kashaya Tawi, the cultural law that binds you, us, and all other things to our earth and our lands here along the Sonoma coast. And Kashaya Tawi teaches us that for what is given, something is taken. For what is taken, something is given. And all these things go to that law of reciprocity into the before world where Kashaya people sat with all the other beings and decided who's going to come down to this earth? Who goes first? What's our purpose for going there? So we came down and the plant people, the plant beings, 
said, we'll give our lives for you. Whether we're above ground or below ground, it made no difference. In the water, out of the water, makes no difference. They'll give their lives for all of us to give us nourishment, to give us ceremony, to give us healing. The rocks, the rock beans did the same thing. We'll, we'll give you shelter. We'll, we'll mark areas where I think you all, or some of you call them vortexes. But in Kashaya, we would say it's a power place. It's a way up place. It's a place that we would go for prayer and ceremony. And those rock beans did that for us. And then the animals did that. Every single one of them, from the littlest to the biggest animal, did that exact thing. He said, we'll give our lives for you. But in return, you Kashaya people will do this. You will honor us with ceremony. You will honor us when you take our lives. You won't take our lives for no reason at all. You'll take it in a good way. And then every year, here are the ceremonies that will make Kashaya people give you the ability to make these things whole, to make this, this forest whole, to make these waters whole, to make these plants and the two, the winged and the two legged and everything else around us whole. And so we've been doing that. We've been doing that, but we've, we've been missing some of these pieces. So why do this now? So there's a good question that gentleman asked from the fisheries. I have opinions on fisheries and fishermen, but I happen to be a fisherman myself, and I'm Hawaiian too, so you know I'll eat anything that comes out of that water. But why now? Because Kashaya says it's time. Because the, the, no matter what it is that the scientific world does, it's nothing without the cultural side, without the cultural world that provide that we provide. It's, the, it's like uh, we're your big brother and it's time. And we're telling you, I'm telling you, on behalf of the Kashaya Pomo people, it's time. Do it. Heck, we've got a mile and a half of ocean up there. It's beautiful. Bring it to our land. We'll host you. Bring it to us first. We want it first in Kashaya. No disrespect to Greg. He probably wants it first here. And I think he could beat me if we were in a race running, but I could probably beat him in tic-tac-toe or something. So if we had to bet Indian way, I'm sure one way or the other, Kashaya may come out on top on that. But yeah, you know, we're ready for it. Bring it, bring it up to us. You know, um, our river otters, they thrive. I know the first time I saw a river otter on the, on the land, I was just like, what in the hell is wrong with you, boy? You know, just kind of going along and he was, going up two miles, you know, if anybody knows plantation, some of you do, I know you do, They're going up to plantation to go get the fish because that thing knew they had just restocked it. I'm like, damn, you know, are they paying attention to tail numbers on helicopters? Like, how does this, how does this otter, are they, are they this smart? Uh, you know, and yeah, it, it's time. We're ready for it ceremonially, Kashai is ready for it. And that took a long time. That took more than a hundred years to get to a place with the Alaska natives where we forgive each other. And uh, I had seen some of the smaller otters down in Monterey Bay. And I just told y'all I was just up in Alaska. One of the places I was at was Homer. I've never seen that big of a sea otter before. And I get it now. A gentleman was talking about the difference between the, uh, the southern uh, otters and the northern otters. I, I didn't know there were blood and crip otters, but apparently there are. <laughs> and. Uh, and, you know, I haven't seen both of them. Holy, those things are huge, you know. And my God, uh, our kelp forest needs it. And there's a big part of this balance. You know, my family, we're from Sine uh, Achakawali, and uh, that's a village that is in, in Kashaya's lands. But the other village that we're from is, is Dukashal. And uh, it's frustrating because that, like, literally translates into Abalonieville. And... Uh, it's been tough not being able to go out and get abalone the way that we do, you know, and it's such a staple in our ceremonial and our subsistence life. And I've got elders that are side eyeing me, and I know that I'm not doing enough. So, you know, anything that helps the forest, uh, the kelp forest, um, the scientific side of me of why now says because that biodiversity is important, because every little thing that in that side of that ocean, uh, it all contributes to the overall health of the ocean. And, uh, and we found out the hard way, you found out the hard way. Shia found out the hard way that when you pull the leg out from underneath the chair, it gets real unsturdy. And, uh, and that's exactly what's happened to our ocean with the, the stripping of our, our kelp. Man, that's tough to see. You know, and we, we go, we'll go down at Stewart's Point where you used to be able to just rock pick and the abalone were so abundant. 
and uh, nothing's hunting those urchins, man. They're just middle fingering us, you, me, all of us. You know, they're not afraid of anything. They just destroyed those those kelp beds. It's real sad to see. And I remember when uh, on the first big, big uh, storm that came, seeing you know hundreds of abalone washed up on the beach, and just so much kelp. You know, that's a normal thing, but that kelp it was roots. You know, it was the roots, and we were thinking, oh no, something's not right. You know, something's not right. And then here we are 15 years later, and we, we we're trying to fix it. So, um, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all about Kishaya's history, our perspective, a little bit about our cultural law. It's good to see a lot of friendly faces in here, a lot of folks that I know and have worked with, state parks guys that just don't get enough credit for all the hard work they do, and our supervisor who is uh, – doing everything that you can and doing it well. And I appreciate that. So, you know, and then and of course I get to pick on Jared a little bit because that's my guy over there. He, he's going to fix all this and he's going to fund whatever we want. So <laughs> you guys get, get your funding requests in as soon as you can. Thank you. If there's any questions, happy to answer. No, I, yeah, you know my life. Yeah, because I got, I have to run. I'd love to stay, but you all, my life is crazy. <laughs> I barely made it here. Sorry. <laughs> but technically, I'm never gone, right? So, it's Kashia Lance. Any questions from members of the public? I think that you stunned everyone into silence, um, which is a good thing. Oh, it's um, cool. it's yes. Good. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Chairman. Thank you. We are so lucky um, to have such wonderful tribal leadership representing the entirety of the Sonoma Coast. And I think that it's safe to say um, that we sort of I guess, what is it, like bat well above our average or sort of punch above our weight range in, with respect to Sonoma County being, you know, a relatively small county and a very large country. And yet we have tremendous advocacy occurring at the national level in the top tiers of government, thanks to Chairman Franklin's um, leadership. So thank you so much for everything that you do for all of us. And thank you for coming out here today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I'm about to introduce yet another fantastic champion of the coast, um, and not just this coast, but the coast all the way to the Oregon border, correct? Yes. Um, and before I introduce um, Congressman Huffman, I do want to acknowledge that I think this is a really unprecedented appearance of local state federal and tribal partners here in Sonoma County. And um, in addition to myself, we actually have county leadership, both from Mendocino as well as Marin. And so I wanted to acknowledge Supervisors Rice and Rajoni from Marin and Supervisor William from Williams from Mendocino. Um, one thing that we have been told by the scientists is that sea otters often don't stay where you put them. And so it is critical to have a regional partnership that is really sort of strong, particularly at the local level. Um, we also actually have two seated coastal commissioners and were joined early, earlier this morning by a former um, coastal commissioner. So I wanted to acknowledge Commissioner Hart and Commissioner Rice. Um, who play a critical role in sort of the statewide representation. And Sonoma County is actually, I believe, going to be the first county to move forward a local coastal plan to the California Coastal Commission that includes support for reintroduction for sea otters actually as part of their LCP. And I wanted to acknowledge that um, previously we had Sarah Amanzada, who is Deputy Secretary for California Natural Resources. Um, and we also have representatives from every single one of our local state legislators. That would be Assemblymember Wood, Senator McGuire, Assemblymember Connolly. So thank you for your participation. And now without further ado, I think that uh, we have one of the absolute, like this is, you know, not hyperbole, this is actually a deserved superlative, um, most ardent environmental leaders in the country who works on behalf of Northern California. Um, 
He has brought so much to our coast, not only in terms of critical resources for restoration and rehabilitation of our offshore marine ecosystems, but also in terms of protective legislation and advocacy to really steward our natural resources. In addition, I think that he is one of the legislators who has the highest priority on tribal partnerships and working directly with tribes to advance environmental initiatives and also uplift indigenous knowledge. So thank you so much, Congressman Huffman, um, for taking time out of your insanely busy schedule to join us here today. And without further ado, please join me in a round of applause for Congressman Huffman. All right. Well, Supervisor Hopkins, I think you deserve a round of applause for pulling this group together and having this forum. I am just so impressed uh, with what you have pulled together here today, and I'm so honored to be part of it. Um, every now and then, we have a chance to do something that just makes a lot of sense, that rights are wrong, uh, that makes things better. And I am convinced, and we can talk a little more about why that is, but I am convinced that uh, bringing back sea otters to the North Coast is one of those things. Um, so I have had the chance to be briefed by um, federal officials who've been studying uh, the feasibility of this, and I uh, have come to believe that the science is strong, uh, the case uh, for doing this is super solid, and the timing is right. Uh, so I think it's important that we start to have this conversation, and uh, Supervisor, you're doing it in the right way. I'm so impressed with the different folks that you've brought into this conversation. This is exactly the right way to go, and I'm also really proud uh, that at least two of the tribes I represent are right here, fired up, ready to go as partners. Thanks, uh, Chair Franklin, for your enthusiasm and your passion and your vision. Um, but I represent Indian country all the way to the Oregon border. And I will tell you that I've got tribes all the way up in Humboldt and Del Norte County that are excited about this too. And we've got some successful co-management um, wins to build on as, as a foundation for how we might be able to do this uh, in a really new and, and different and an exciting way. I'm thinking in particular of the way that the Yurok tribe has partnered with the federal and, and state and local officials uh, on the successful reintroduction of the California condor. Um, so I just think all the pieces are in place, but I also understand that uh, we've got to bring everybody along here. Um, and let me just reveal one of my biases in this uh, conversation. Not only am I uh, an environmentalist and really excited about bringing back a keystone uh, species like the sea otter. Uh, I, I could wonk out with all of you about the, the science of keystone species and why this is such a fascinating and compelling story. Uh, but I also like to fish. Uh, in fact, I've fished right here out of Bodega Bay many times. I like to catch and eat fish. And, you know, whether it's rockfish, lingcod, you know, whatever I can pull out off the coast here, uh, or salmon when they'll let us, uh, when, when, they, when they leave a little water in the rivers and allow us to catch salmon, uh, that's another story. Uh, or even on my kayak uh, up in Sea Ranch, uh, you know, pulling, pulling lingcod out. I love to do that. And I am convinced that restoring sea otters is going to be great for fishing, okay? And I know that for some, that might be a little bit counterintuitive. So we've really got to um, explain how bringing back an animal, which at first blush, uh, you know, likes to eat fish like all of us, uh, might seem to be a little bit of a threat to those who like to catch rockfish and lingcod and, and salmon and other things. Uh, but I am also convinced that when you look at the big picture and the full story, Chairman Franklin, you talked about Stewart's Point and what's going on out there with the kelp forest and the urchins. Um, I, I think everyone will come to see that bringing back sea otters is even a great thing for those like me who like to catch fish. So um, I am just super excited about all of this. Um, I am so pleased that I get to represent this entire North Coast area that stands to benefit I think in just about every way from the reintroduction of sea otters. Uh, and I'm really grateful for all of you, especially you, Supervisor Hopkins, in, in having the leadership to bring this together. So count on me. Uh, I'm, I'm here for the long haul. 
Uh, we're doing everything we can right now to try to bring back the kelp forests. We are uh, bringing some new resources to the table to support uh, the, the, uh, the Friends Group at the Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary uh, and other folks who are working on some interventions to try to bring kelp back. Uh, but the reintroduction of the sea otter is, a, is one of those interventions uh, that can not only help the kelp forest, but uh, bring back some balance to this coastal ecosystem so that as climate change continues to throw curveballs at us, uh, we will have a stronger, more resilient ecosystem that's ready uh, to withstand that. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, but uh, just really grateful to see all of you and super excited about next steps to actually make this happen. All right. So we will pass the microphone around for questions. And since Chairman Franklin is still here and maybe could stay for at least another five or 10 minutes. Um, also, if you have questions after sort of mulling this over for Chairman Frank Franklin or Congressman Huffman, um, please feel free to ask. So if you raise your hand, we will run around um, with the microphone. And you might have to duck behind the podium because I don't know if we have an extra mic. Um, but please go ahead and raise your hands if you have any questions. And while we're waiting for the brave person to take the first step, I would also want to acknowledge um, that really one of the reasons that this summit exists at all are conversations that I have had with Chairman Franklin, but also the leadership of Congressman Huffman. It was actually Congress that funded the study that I found about from, out about from Brock Dolman of the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center um, that led to us reaching out to other stakeholders and the momentum just grew because all of you are here for a reason, for a passion, for a desire for restoration. So thank you all for being here and thank you so much for your leadership because we wouldn't be here truly without you. I'll repeat the first question that came up earlier and it was why introduction and why now? Uh, well, Am I working? Yeah. So introduction, as I understand it from the conversations I've had with the, the folks who know the science, uh, is going to be necessary because uh, the, the populations in Monterey Bay, Santa Cruz, are just unable to uh, expand their range north, I think due to shark predation. Uh, and so we're going to have to bring them up here. And um, once we do that, I think there's every reason to believe that uh, they would establish here and hopefully spread even, extend their range even further north. Um, did that answer your question? Thank you, yes. Yeah. Are there other questions? Um, sure. Hi, I'm Tara Duggan with the San Francisco Chronicle, and it sounds like there's a lot of momentum, you know, just the last two of you spoke about the desire for this to happen. Can you talk a little bit about what it would take for it to happen? next steps. Uh, yeah, and so we should probably bring the Fish and Wildlife Service into this to talk about the technical things that, here we go, what do you know? On cue, on cue, Lillian's here. Uh, but look, the, the Endangered Species Act has a mechanism for reintroducing species that have been extirpated in ways that help to avoid conflicts. You know, some people may be concerned about that. Are they going to get hit with an ESA take violation for, you know, going fishing or Marine Mammal Protection Act violation for coming within a certain proximity of these, these critters. I, I, I'm gonna let you answer all those tough questions. Uh, there's a way to do it. Uh, the law envisions all of that. Um, but in terms of uh, you know timing and, and why now, I think this kelp forest die off has been a huge wake up call uh, to the entire North Coast. Um, that something is out of whack. And climate change is throwing curveballs at us with changing ocean conditions. Um, this is a moment where bringing this keystone predator back into the North Coast ecosystem uh, can be very responsive uh, to those challenges that we're facing. So um, the process is a multi-year, multi-step process. And so as I mentioned when I was up here earlier, we're really in the very beginning stages we're hearing from people and we're, um, we're literally consulting with people. We don't have a proposal, we don't have a plan. We, we're at the ground floor right now. Um, so what would happen is later this summer, we're having some open houses where we're um, traveling up and down the North Coast from Oregon, starting in Astoria and ending in Emeryville. I'm hearing from communities, um, com hearing from people like you, you know, that 
you either want sea otters or you have concerns or you have um, environmental issues that sea otters might help to solve for you. Um, we just want to hear from everyone. And then from there, we'll decide whether um, we want to put forth a proposal. And in the background, um, Dr. Tim Tinker and people from Monterey Bay Aquarium are working on developing models of um, what, what habitat would be suitable, what population growth would be like, and we want to hear from the public about what the socioeconomic criteria are in each place and how we would measure those criteria, how you think we should best measure them. And then we're going to put it all together in Tim's magic math machine, and we're going to um, perhaps come out with um, some alternatives. But at every step of the way, there is an off-ramp that says, no, we're going to stop. And so we have to be convinced, OK, well, we're going to continue to the next step. And so then ultimately, if um, we put forth a formal proposal, then we go through the NEPA process, National Environmental Policy Act. So we would do scoping, meaning we, something like this, where we get everyone's thoughts um, about what the important issues are. Then we um, do a scoping report. We formulate um, potential alternatives. We put out a draft environmental impact statement. We have a public comment period. We have hearings. We take everyone's input. We put out a final environmental impact statement. And then we decide what to do. And one of those options would be a no action alternative. And then there would be several options. And then after that, then we could maybe start actually doing something with otters. But then, as we've heard, that also takes time. So this is not something that happens instantly, but um, it's a long process. And so if we want it to happen, we do need to start it right away. And so this is the first conversation um, along that path. I'm going to jump in because I actually have a question, which is I'm wondering if you, as well as Chairman Franklin, could touch on opportunities for tribal co-management. Mm -hmm. uh, is, that, is that for me, Supervisor? Yeah, for all the Chairman Franklin. Sure. Yeah. So I, I think this is a perfect candidate for tribal co-management. Um, I don't want to speak for the Fish and Wildlife Service, but uh, they did a beautiful job uh, up in the northern part of my district with the California condor reintroduction. And that was such uh, a close partnership uh, between the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, both uh, the National Park Service and California State Parks and the Yurok tribe. Um, and I think that could be the exact model to build on for the sea otter. But uh, what do you think? Yeah, so I think probably they're telling me to go up front, so I didn't want to do that, but here I am. Um, yeah. Yurok definitely started a process. Um, I, th I, I envision it looking a little different. You know, you look at like co-management between tribes on the, in the plains and, and buffalo. And in every one of those, there's a tribal take and a protection for that. And um, hey, man, you know, Kashai people haven't used uh, our sea otter in ceremony or in ceremonial regalia for 150 years. And so how do we incorporate that, incorporate that um, very important cultural component into what this looks like with sea otters and our ability to, to use that? You know, and I know that Yurok did something similar. I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about it. I think they did something similar with feathers and that was appropriate for that tribe. And so I think that with this ocean management and with this co-management opportunity we have for our little um, sea friends, that uh, that it 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 opens up some doors for some discussions that I think will be very unique, um, just as unique as Sonoma County people are. No disrespect to Marin and Mendocino. Now that I know you're here, <laughs> and hey, Carol, I love you. It's good to see you as well. But um, you know, but but. We, we, we are unique in a, in a better, awesomest way that I like to brag about because we're at West County, Sonoma, and it's where the world started. And that's a very kashaya centric point of view. And, the, and, uh, and as chairman, I like to make sure everybody knows that's the way we think. So co-management, yeah, there's an opportunity there. Um, and, and it'll be neat and interesting to see what it looks like. I happen to have brought um, some otter back with me, uh, oddly enough, 
uh, for some of our traditional people to to use and I had to go up to Alaska and pay for that both ceremonial way and then other ways. So it'd be nice to do that with our own our own otters for a change. Yeah, so the Marine Mammal Protection Act has an exemption for um, subsistence use by coastal Alaskan natives, but that's limited to Alaska. So in the lower 48, there is no so much, there is no such exemption. But um, here's an idea for people who make laws. Um, I'm not allowed to talk, <laughs> not allowed to talk to them, so I'm going to look this way. Um, in California, we have a very robust stranding response program where we pick up all the dead sea otters that are reported, we do necropsies on them, and we have lots and lots of sea otter parts. And because we have so many people in California, we find those otters right away a lot of the time. And so we have some very freshly dead otters with beautiful pelts. And so I think it would be fantastic if um, we did something that's similar to the Bald and Golden Eagle Act, where there's a feather repository, we could have an otter part repository. And nothing would make me happier than to have those parts from incidentally dead sea otters that have received a necropsy, and we save those parts and we distribute them to tribes who want to use them for cultural purposes. And so as far as I know, we don't have a mechanism for that. Um, we might need to talk to our lawyers and see if there's anything that um, that currently exists in the MMPA that allows it. Several years ago, we looked into this. It might have been your request that prompted us to look into this. And we were told, to our immense frustration, that there was no mechanism for it. So I think a little sentence mm -hmm. um, thrown in there might um, make a big difference. Somebody just gave me a good bill idea. So I, I appreciate that very uh, much. You have my so. support on that, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> We have a comedy show tonight. If you go to, uh, we'll be back at eight o'clock. No, but no, the, um, they're, they're, the Alaska thing's bigger than that. It's not just subsistence. It's also that um, depending on the island or the part of Alaska, uh, only certain Alaska native tribes are allowed to work with sea otters in a certain way. Um, only a, an Alaska native person from those particular areas like uh, What's Kodiak? Kodiak Island. Um, you know, only only they're allowed to work on certain things, uh, and that that extends to walrus tusks and across the board. And so I think that you know when we're looking for that opportunity for co-management and defining what that is, that all of those aspects are put in there too, because we still have traditional people that know how to use and work with, you know, that that sea otter pelt. And so you know, I, I kind of it's not like you know all of a sudden like there's an otter, yay, let's go cut it up and do something stupid. It's, there's, there's very strict, strict rules culturally to how Kashaya people can interact with um, you know, different species, including otters. And so we still have that knowledge, that traditional knowledge exists within our tribe. All these generations later, and that's because of amazing people like Essie Parrish who protected that knowledge and said that someday that's gonna come back to the tribe and my responsibility and then now your responsibility and passed it down was to make sure that when those things came back that Kashaya people were ready. And so that's that's a big thing too. And you know, why now? Because we're ready. Still. I'll bring you a mic. Hi, so I'm Karen Gear with State Coastal Conservancy, and I just wanted to make sure that everybody in this room was aware that right now we have a request for proposals available for sea otter projects. It's a small pot of money. It's money that comes through the state tax checkoff. Um, we have a couple hundred thousand dollars. The, the proposals are due in July, uh, mid-July. But if you go on our website, scc.ca.gov, you can see the, uh, the request for proposals. And I'm as I'm listening to this conversation, I'm thinking that there could be some, you know, portion of a study or something that could help further this discussion that you all might want to think about applying for. So. You know, one thing comes to mind, Karen, I don't know if it's this or if you all have talked about this before I got here, but um, 
the potential tourism windfall of bringing back the sea otter needs to be part of this conversation. I mean, anyone who's ever been to Elkhorn Slough and gone out on kayaks and just seen what this does, I mean, people come from all over the place uh, to be out among the sea otters. Um, it is big, big business uh, that could be really great for this entire North Coast. Uh, Mary Callahan with the Press Democrat. Um, I'm wondering if someone could address uh, how the how the otters would be reintroduced in terms of the um, supply of otters that would be moved. Um, as I understand, there are about 3,000 southern sea otters, and I'm wondering what that would mean for the existing population, or or whether there might be um, other other options. Yeah. So as I mentioned, we're in the very early stages, so uh, we don't know what otters might be used, but um, options are to use wild sea otters from the southern sea otter range. Um, and if you're taking sea otters from areas where they're at or near carrying capacity, you're not really having a, an impact on that donor population because you're taking away some of the competition from the otters that are um, remaining there. So that's one option. But we know from past experience that there is some really high attrition of otters that are moved from one place to the next because they have a very strong site fidelity. And so about 90% would be expected to leave if the same methods are used that were used in the past. Um, another option would be to do some modification of that. And people are currently discussing what modifications could be done with um, reintroduced wild sea otters. Then um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and you'll be hearing from a representative um, of theirs later, they've been doing this amazing program of um, rehabilitating stranded, orphaned, wild sea otter pups. They raise them um, under human, well, not really under human care, under the care of um, surrogate mother sea otters. So these are non-releasable adult female sea otters that take the pup um, under their wing and teach them some things and then those juveniles are later released. And they have, um, it's a very intensive process, but um, it's a very successful process as well. Um, so, but those are small numbers of sea otters. So there's a lot of um, questions about what otters would be used. Would it be some combination? Would there be any northern sea otters involved? Or would it be all southern sea otters, um, our threatened subspecies? Those are all questions that have yet to be decided. We have time for one last question. Okay. Yeah. I'll we'll give, we'll give you a dozen. We'll give you a baker's dozen. They're incredibly cute. This should, this should be really quick. Um, you know, I, I, I'm just interested in, uh, you know, I, see, I can see the, the animals making it very well in the, in the bay, or in the bay in this estuaries and things. What, I, what I'm curious about is the, you know, the scientific end of this and their survival potential in an area that's outside Bodega Bay, being that there are large quantities of sharks here. I mean, I've seen them myself. I've, I've interacted with them on a regular basis when we're fishing. So I'm just wondering, is there, are we sure this is going to work? Do we, do we know that? With sea otters, we're never sure of anything. The one thing we're sure of is that sea otters will do what they want to do within the context of the options we give them. Um, so yes, we don't want to throw sea otters to the sharks. And sharks are one of the main reasons that we haven't seen range expansion in 20 years of the southern sea otter range in either direction. But it's been a lot longer since we've seen northward range expansion. And we believe that's because of the high density of sharks um, up there near the current end of the northern um, range. So that's why estuaries are especially favorable um, in our eyes, because estuaries have shallow waters. They mostly um, prevent entry of white sharks. Um, estuaries, we now see, can support extremely high densities of sea otters and the populations can grow faster in an estuary than on the outer coast just because of the configuration of the habitat. Um, so yes, we're looking hard at estuaries. Then there's the idea, well, you put sea otters somewhere, they often go wherever they want. That's what they do. 
So we could put them in an estuary and they could leave and they could get um, whacked by sharks. It's very possible. Uh, it's even likely. Um, but sea otters, um, you know, as people have mentioned, they're not dumb either. So um, if they become aware of shark bite mortality, and there's debate about how much sea otters are aware of it because it's usually a stealth attack. Um, if they become aware of it, they quickly adjust their behavior. As they have with killer whales, they adjust their behavior. We don't know if they're aware of white sharks. Um, but if they become aware, then they will adjust their behavior. And then there's just um, the reality that estuaries are, as we've seen in Elkhorn Slough, they're extremely favorable habitat, especially for mothers with pups. Because um, out on the outer coast, you have storms and things. Your chance of pup separation is a lot greater on the outer coast, especially during storms. Uh, in, inside estuaries in Elkhorn Slough, Slough, we see these females way back there in the salt marsh. They never, as far as we know, they never even leave the slough. Um, they have their pups back there. It's fan fantastic habitat. But then if we want to restore kelp beds, you know, we probably, maybe we want to pick an estuary with rocky habitat right outside. So we have this sort of back and forth between the kelp forest sea otters right outside the estuary, and we kind of have this safe um, source of otters in the estuary. But again, that's not, certainly not for me alone to decide. We have a lot of great minds um, thinking about all these options. And again, no options whatsoever have been decided on. This is the beginning of the conversation. <laughs> Thank you so much. And we will have time again for questions um, later today, but so as to not interfere with anyone's lunch, um, we are going to break now until 12, uh, I'm sorry, 12 o'clock, and there is lunch outside at the registration tables for everyone to pick up. And thank you so much, Congressman Huffman.